what started our interest in connecting with uh, the bigger, wider world um, is also related to how we see ourselves as artists and educators and researchers. But um, the idea that a musician learns by practicing for hours or days or months on end by themselves has sort of largely been accepted to be untrue. And similarly, the idea that a doctoral student should lock themselves in a cupboard for four years with a bunch of books and somehow emerge with a dissertation um, has, is, is a sort of dated idea of what we do and what we should be doing as academics. Uh, why do research if the only people who care about it or understand it or know about it is ourselves? Uh, perhaps especially in Finland where the taxpayer uh, taxpayers' money funds our education, we have a responsibility to be open and clear to the general public about what we do, why it matters, and to feed the knowledge and information that we learn back into the community that it comes from. Funding also comes from government agencies, meaning that we have to be able to clearly define what our research does, for who, and why. The crux of this is being able to not only explain what we do as researchers, but answer the two very important questions about our research. So what? And who cares? Other than ourselves. So in answering these two questions effectively, it's also important to communicate our research well. And perhaps the most obvious example of what happens when scientists fail to communicate well to the public has resulted in what we now term the climate change debate. I saw a video on YouTube, it's from 2011, and there's an internationally renowned climatologist called Steven Schneider, and he has this huge auditorium of people in a university. Um, it's massive, it's like a football stadium, stadium of people. Um, and they're all there to hear him talk about the climate. And they're all climate change skeptics. And the discussion, it's on YouTube, you can probably find it, but it's, um, it begins with the audience members being posed a particular question. Do you agree that climate change is man-made? And responses to this include, not at all. No one has proven to me that it's man-made. All I see is big hysteria just for money. The only reason that you are getting grant money is because the climate is warming. If we didn't have this hysteria, then there'd be no grants, and none of you people making any money at all. I believe in climate change, the climate always changes, but I haven't seen any evidence to date that discounts natural climate change. And I've seen nothing in the literature that I've read that sees anything abnormal, A, with the warming, or B, with the rate of warming. And I'm not too much of a skeptic, but I do believe that climate change is something that happens naturally in our world. What mankind is doing is just accelerating it. It's natural, and it does fall into a climatical pattern. These aren't stupid people. They have understandings of commerce, of social movements, of statistics, and of science. But the inability of climate scientists to communicate hard evidence-based scientific research has resulted in widespread misunderstanding and mistrust of the very experts who are responsible for finding out what's going on. And this comes from a so-called hard science. Without a careful and coordinated response to climate change, we as a species and as a planet are facing considerable and indeed deadly consequences. Now, nobody dies if you teach them the violin the wrong way. But this doesn't mean that our research is less important or that it doesn't matter. It just means that it's even more important for us to be able to communicate what we find out in our research and also why it matters and who it matters to. It also means that you are precisely the right person to be talking about your research and matters relating to it, lest somebody else do it for you and make light of or misinterpret your work or area of interest entirely. We started this project in, in the fall of 2015. Uh, and what we have been doing, we have contacted magazine editors, for instance, asking if we can write short, popular, popularized texts based on our research. We have created posters to be displayed at 
for researchers, teachers and the general public to see. We have written, uh, we have been written blog posts for the arts, the artist, uh, uh, Art Eagle Research Initiative and our own websites. We have sent press releases on completed um, research which has gone to be published in over 10 newspapers around Finland already. So it is very important to keep busy and engaged and active. And what to do then? I have five points here to start. There are other things to do as well, but there are some general things, at least what we have been doing. Firstly, you have to be aware. You have to currently uh, follow the discussions in the media and find your own position there. Is there an article related to your topic in the newspaper that you disagree with? Or do you want to give an, another angle or just deepen the article? You have to be active and you have to react. Secondly, map the media that is suitable for your topic. In our case, in music, uh, really, uh, we have to use, uh, of course, the music me media, but also the related medias. Uh, field, yeah, fields, for instance, education, uh, psychology, and other arts, and so on. So not only the music uh, media is the one to contact. And then thirdly, use your connections. If you know journalists, or if your friends know, know them, keep them informed. And fourthly, don't be shy. You are the expert, and you know the topic better than anybody else. So you don't want anybody else to talk on behalf of you. And this is very important. You want to go to the news if it is on your topic. You don't want anybody else to do that. It is clear, I think. Uh, fifthly, be awake and ready. <coughs> know what you are talking about. The journalist can call when, whenever, for instance, early in the morning or late at night. The researchers who have joined the uh, research research project have already already received phone calls from journalists, for instance, while checking in the airport flight desk, while driving, uh, or the morning after celebrating the thesis defense, for instance. So these are very difficult situations, and you have to be ready. You have to know what to say. Uh, because this really, the journalist can call you whenever. And for it, one another case, it was quite a tense situation. Uh, one of our doctoral students uh, was called by Yle at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon asking for a television interview in a music center in 20 minutes. <laughs> We ran to the opera area looking for makeup. <laughs> and they did it. It wasn't me. <laughs> uh, journalists do not reschedule and they do not think about, about what is the most convincing for you. They need a story and they need it fast. Okay. And there are several ways how to uh, practice these things. For instance, to be clear and know what, to, what you are talking about. And maybe you don't know. Yeah. Um, 
So first I'm, I'll talk a little bit about those um, surprising moments where a journalist does uh, phone you, um, which can happen, particularly if you've contacted them before. Um, I got a phone call on Tuesday morning to which my husband said, oh, you must be on a list. So I'm on the list. And I got a phone call um, Tuesday morning from a journalist working with Ulla, who said, are you doing research in music schools? And, yeah, just, just started it. Okay, I have some questions, okay. Why is it important that children learn music? <laughs> oh. So these kinds of really basic questions can sometimes be really confronting making us think about, really, what's the essence of your, of your research? What's the point? And why do you do it? And who benefits? Um, so it's important to be prepared and to breathe. Um, and one strategy that I've found to be quite helpful, and others have as well, is what is termed a hisibore in Finnish, or in English, I guess it's translated to an elevator pitch. So the idea is, about, is to tell somebody else about your research um, why you do it, and who it benefits in the time it takes to travel in an elevator. Uh, in Helsinki, we don't have so many tall buildings, so you don't have much time. Um, I'm going to say one minute. It's not only about what you say, but it's also how you say it. Before we started working on this research reach-out project, quite often when people would ask me, what's your dissertation about? The ever-innocent question that everybody hates. Um, I generally want to crawl in a hole with my dissertation, um, breathe an audible sigh, and then bother something about music and schools and teachers choosing songs and censorship. But I don't mean that teachers are censors and you know there's like rock music and um, it might be inappropriate, but I don't think it's inappropriate. And I'm a... <laughs> so that kind of first impression doesn't really get you far with the media, and it very quickly puts you into a student category rather than an expert category which, whether you like it or not, we all become very quickly as we do our doctoral studies. It's very rare that somebody has the privilege of focusing on a single topic for one or two or three or four or more years of study. So you actually do know your topic more than anybody else. And it is equally as applicable to researchers further along in their careers who bring with them a wealth of experience and knowledge over many years of working and thinking. But this hisi buhe, is uncomfortable whether you are a doctoral student or an experienced researcher. I know because I've asked them. But it is something that you can prepare and continue to work on and adapt for different audiences and different research projects. So for one minute, you need one point, and only one point. And if somebody remembers only one thing about your work, you need to think, what, what is it important that they know? If you get rid of all the theory and all the methodology, all the hours of sweat, sweat and blood and tears, what matters? And while you can communicate that in one to two sentences, if you work on it and think really carefully, it's also necessary to add just a little bit of, of padding to get your point across in an effective and memorable way. And for this, it's useful to remember four key points. Could you press the forward button? Yes. <laughs> The first of which is, who are you? You should introduce yourself by your name, by also your role and your affiliation, the place you work or the place you study. You could also mention your project. You heard in the introduction, I was introduced as an arts equal researcher. Um, and that's also because it, it relates strongly to who I am as a researcher and the work that I'm doing. So that kind of information could be important. But you could equally mention your teaching or your community work or some kind of valuable information that supports your identity as an expert. As long as you can do it in a couple of words. Because you only have one minute in that elevator. And the primary focus should be on your work, not a presentation of yourself. So the second point, what is your research about? Now we are really used to operationalizing what we're saying as researchers, sort of explaining exactly what we mean through reference to other people's work circa 100 years, 90 years, 80 years ago, and so on and so forth, and theoretical constructs and all of this kind of thing, forget it. The media doesn't really care. You need to explain what your research about, preferably in one sentence, maximum two. 
without jargon, without references, without quoting, and without fuss. Explain it as though you're telling a downtown taxi driver what your research is about. You want it to be simple and easily understood because you also want to keep him, have his eyes on the road to get you where you're going. But at the same time, you don't really want to be condescending, so you're not talking to a toddler. Most of the time, you can assume that your audience is intelligent, but just has no idea about your topic. The third point, so what? Why does it matter? It's interesting to think if you explain your research topic to somebody, then imagine they turn around and go, oh, OK, so what? It's an important question. So why does it matter? What are the implications of your research? And this is important not only when we're articulating it to the general public or the media, but if you learn how to do it concisely and well, it serves you very well for funding applications and conference presentations, writing research report, reports, journal articles, dissertations, popularized articles, and so on and so forth. In just a few sentences, being able to explain to somebody why they should care about what you do, to convince them to become intellectually, emotionally, or maybe even financially invested in your work, is an important skill as a researcher. You can do this through logical argumentation or appealing to emotions, such as anger, fear, or pride, or a combination of both. But the point is to make connections between what you do in your work and the broader social needs or interests of real people. And finally, who cares? How does your research relate to the daily life of the people that you're talking to? This is where it's important to think, who am I actually talking to? Part of this is descriptive, explaining how your research affects real people, and part of it is persuasive, explaining why the listener should take an active interest in your work. These four points don't necessarily have to come in this order, and you can be quite clever about how you put them together to capture interest, emotional connections, and attention. For instance, do you have a real-life story from your data that appeals to people's experiences and emotions that illustrates why your research is important? Share it. If you have any findings that might be surprising, or any facts about yourself or your work that are particularly memorable, these are all important ideas to draw upon. Now, as I said before, it's not any important what you say, it's how you say it. There's a Harvard psychologist called Amy Cuddy who focuses particularly on first impressions. And she says that they are based on two questions. Can I trust this person? And can I respect this person? These two dimensions can be understood respectively as warmth and credibility or competence. And ideally, you should appear as though you have both. But her research reveals something really interesting. You'd think that the most important thing about being a researcher, about being an expert, is to appear credible. You want to come across as someone who knows her stuff. You know, I've studied for a long time, and I, I've learned certain skills. You know, I'm talented, I'm smart. These are important things. I'm competent. But Cuddy has found that the most important factor is warmth. It's trustworthiness. Being smart can too easily come across as being a smart ass. Or being competitive or manipulative. Rather than a gift, it's something to give and be shared. It's something to trust. So don't let the surprise of being asked to talk about your research manifest itself as fear or defensiveness. Really, really, I know what I'm talking about. I'm very smart. Just like performing, Sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. And try your best to come across as calm, comfortable, and open until it becomes a more familiar part of your research practice. So what can you do? The first I've mentioned, breathe. It's not always easy when you have, hi, I'm a researcher calling from Ule. And if you're in front of a camera, Make eye contact with the camera. <laughs> so make the impression of appreciating having the opportunity to talk about what you do and what you're interested in, and share what you know, rather than appearing arrogant or terrified. It might only be one minute long, but if you only aim to convey the most important point through the four ideas outlined before, who, what, who you are, what you do, so what, and who cares, 
you don't actually have to rush. When you want to emphasize a point, you can afford to give it some space, to pause, to breathe, to make the point clearly. Consider your tone of voice. Is the occasion more serious or more informal? Are you being interviewed in relation to a somber event? Don't laugh. Or is it a celebration? Laugh. Have fun. So you have to adapt your hissy head to the situation. Visualize the impression that you want to give and find role models in research or somewhere else. Anybody who's communicating well to large groups of people without relying on jargon or academies. Practice in the mirror, practice with your family if they'll tolerate you, and video yourself presenting wherever possible. <laughs> and continue to work on these skills and improve them, because they can be learnt and they can be improved, and you never know when you might need them. <laughs>